Hello, welcome to The Link. My name is Jake, and today we're going to be explaining some very cool science. Watch this super cool video. I have two electrodes here, and there's going to be 120 volts AC on here. And I'm going to be sticking the pickle on here. And when I stick it on here and turn it on, mysteriously, the pickle is going to light up a really yellow color. Nothing happening yet. I can see some bubbling. <laughs> Whoa. <laughs> what a cool experiment. What's going on here? Why is the pickle only glowing on one end? And why is it glowing at all? To answer these questions, let's take a look at what our friend Jan has to say. He's our collaborator in Germany and he got his master's in physics. I started with this really simple idea, which is neglecting a crazy lot of stuff about the setup. As you do in physics. As you do in physics, of course. <laughs> and I thought, what would it look like if I had those sodium ions in a free vacuum perfect capacitor that is made up of two, just two plates that are parallel to each other. So my idea was if I have this capacitor and if I apply a, um, a voltage that is alternating, it would be a sine wave. And what would actually happen to those ions? And I didn't do crazy complicated physics. I just used good old Newton's uh, third ax axiom, as it's known in Germany, the, the famous F equals M times A. And well, the acceleration uh, becomes a sine wave. Jan just mentioned a capacitor and a sinusoidal current. Let's see what that has to do with the phenomenon. What is a capacitor? Well, it's an electric component used in many circuits. And we can think of it as two sheets of metal in, you know, a closed circuit. Let's just draw our little battery here. Uh, yes, I believe that is how it works. Okay, so we're going to have a positive side and a negative side on this capacitor. That means that on the positive side, we'll say that positive current is running through the circuit this way. And positive charge will accumulate on this side, negative charge will accumulate on this side. This creates an electric field between the two plates. Right, and we call this electric field homogeneous. We pretty much ignore these fringe electric fields that you're going to get on the side. Homogeneous just because it's even throughout. Now what happens if I put a, an electric charged ion inside of this capacitor is it's going to feel a force from the electric field. The force is going to be equal to the electric charge of the ion times the magnitude of the electric field that it's in. This sodium ion is going to feel because it has a, an electric charge of one, it's going to feel that times the magnitude of the electric field. Now, if we're having alternating current, that would mean that this positive and negative switch, and in Germany that happens at a frequency of 50 hertz, so 50 times a second, these two alternate. And it's not just a hard on off, it alternates in a sinusoidal current of, say, this side being positive and then negatively charged and positively charged and then negatively charged. Now that's going to mean that this sodium ion is going to experience a force this way, and then that way, and then this way, and then that way. It's going to start bumping into other sodium ions and maybe exciting electrons and absorbing electrons, emitting photons at the characteristic uh, wavelength that sodium emits light. Okay, we've got a good understanding of what a capacitor and a sinusoidal current is. Now let's go through the details of how that plays out into our velocity equation for the sodium ion and also what that means for our average velocity and why we see the pickle glowing on one end. Let's go back to science, Jake. Okay, we're gonna do some math now. Oh, geez. So we're saying that this electric field is alternating in this gherkin and we previously explained that it'll be alternating in a sinusoidal fashion, right? So let's just say that uh, we'll assume that this electric field is oscillating at, you know, maybe it has a magnitude of epsilon naught times a sine of omega t plus phi. Here omega is our angular frequency, that's two over the period. T is time, uh, electric field is a function of, and phi here is our phase. That just determines if this sine wave is shifted left or right, right? So that's just a general form for an electric field in a standard capacitor. Then we're going to say, okay, if we know this electric field, we know from earlier that the force a 
ion will feel inside of this electric field is equal to the charge of the ion times the electric field itself. So the charge of the ion in this case would be 1, but we're going to leave it as Q. And we're going to say it's Q epsilon naught. We're just bringing down our electric field sine of omega t plus phi. All good and well. Now we also know from Newton's second law that the sum of our forces in any given vectorized direction is equal to the mass of our particle times the acceleration, which can be also be written this way with an x uh, double, double time derivative of position. OK, so why are we doing this? You know, we found the electric field, then we found the force, and now we're going to eventually try and find the acceleration experienced by the particle. This is all to see if we can gain more information about what's happening to the ions. You know, we're wondering why is the gherkin only lighting up on one side and not the other side mainly, and then also we're wondering why do we see this excitement? And if the more information we can gain about the particles, the more information that we can see about the behavior that's happening. And maybe something will pop out that's interesting. We can find the acceleration, and that will just be dividing on both sides by m. You'll get the acceleration is equal to, if we take our force here, it's going to be q over the mass times epsilon naught sine of omega t plus phi. We know acceleration. If, say, we take the, if we integrate over time of this position, we can end up with velocity as a function of time. Uh, you know, we need that. So integrating this sine term, we're going to get a negative cosine term. And that will be equal to q over m, don't forget the negative, uh, this omega is going to come out, omega epsilon naught cosine omega t plus phi. We actually want this omega to be in the denominator. Yep, so that's our position. What's this plus c? OK, let's assume we know some basic things about the circuit when we're starting out. Let's say that we know that at, let's say we know at time equals 0, we'll just say that the position at time equals 0, we'll call that x0 and the velocity at time equals 0, we'll call that v0. So we have our equation for velocity, and we know our boundary conditions at, or sorry, our initial conditions at x of 0 and v of 0. Now we want to find c. Uh, if we plug in you know, v at t equals 0 equals v0, then we can see that uh, we have our negative q over m omega e epsilon naught cosine omega t plus phi plus c. So we have our v naught equal to that, and we're going to solve for c. But don't forget to sub in t equals 0. This term goes to 0. So it's just cosine of phi plus c there. If we add this to both sides, we're going to get that c equals our negative q epsilon naught over m omega times cosine of phi plus our v naught. Sorry, I shouldn't have written a negative here. If we plug this c back into our equation for velocity, then we find that v of t equals negative q, there's where the negative is, epsilon naught over m omega cosine omega t plus phi 
plus our C, which we found to be Q epsilon naught over M omega cosine, no time dependence here, just phi plus our V naught. What does this tell us? That's a good question. We have this time dependence term. So velocity obviously depends on time. Then we have this term that does not depend on time. It's completely dependent upon phase and your starting velocity. The initial conditions strongly influence the behavior of the velocity as a function of time. We found our velocity as a function of time. Cool beans. What information can we gather from this? Well, we talked about how this is our time-dependent term. These two are constants dependent on the initial phase that the electric field starts off with and the initial velocity of the ion in the gherkin. OK, this doesn't tell us a lot. It's not super generalizable. So we're going to take a look at the average velocity. We express averages sometimes in these brackets. You know, it's kind of difficult to write about something that you're not talking about. OK, talk about something that you're not writing about. So OK, you guys, <laughs> I'm going to explain something else first. I'm going to do a little aside about averages, because when I was taking calculus the first time, it wasn't completely intuitive to me if I just looked at the equation what was actually happening. So say we have a graph. Uh, this could be time. Right, uh, this could be just some function, let's call it phi. And if our function looks like this, say, for chance, it can look like anything. Then this is our function with respect to time, and this is our time. Now, this function is going to have an average. That average just looks like it would be about here. Uh, how do we find that average? Well, let's take a look at some interesting geometry. We know what an integral is. If we take an integral under this blue curve, under our arbitrary function psi, we're going to get you know, a number, whatnot. But another way to take that integral would be to take this average value and multiply it by, let's call this a, the starting point, and b, the ending point, and multiply it by this um, distance, so you know, b minus a. So we have two ways to find the average. We could either integrate from a to b of our psi with respect to t. But we're going to say that's equivalent to the average value times that same integration length. And that makes more intuitive sense because like here you know the integral is gaining some here and it's losing some here if you take the average and multiply it by that that's effectively the area of a rectangle that's easy to compute and that should equal our integral now if we want to find the average we just divide by b over a that becomes 1 over b minus a the integral from a to b of psi of t dt if this is a cyclic function you could say that this is a period you could say 1 over the period from the integral of over one period of psi of t dt equals our average value of psi if that's a cyclic function. So what do you know? We have a cosine up here in our velocity. That's a, a cyclic function. So we're going to use that formula to find our average velocity. Instead of psi, it's v, right? I'm going to erase this. Ba 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 ba. What was our formula right there? 1 over the period times the integral of, let's say we have an arbitrary starting point, uh, t naught. This is a little bit unnecessary. And just to be formal, we're going to say t naught plus the period. I'm so sorry if you can't see that. Uh, times our velocity function. I'm going to write v of t, because we, it's right up there, you guys. It's right up there. Yeah. OK. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so now we're going to take that integral. So you're going to get a 
time term when you take that integral, and then that's just going to be multiplied by the period, cool, cool. This is a cosine function. Uh, and would you look at that? If you take the integral over a cosine function for one period, same with sine, this integral, it all cancels out and it equals zero. You might, this is, you know, you probably know this stuff. So the integral of this term is going to be zero over, because we're taking the integral over one period. These we're going to get, uh, you know, you know, expectation value of v equals one over our period times this term goes to zero. Uh, epsilon not q over m omega times the period cosine phi whoopsies plus v naught times the period. Look at this. There's a t. There's another t. Yet again. A t shows up. Factor that out. Cancel the t's. What we've all been waiting for. Boom. 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 Our average velocity is e naught. Not e. Our average velocity is e naught q over m omega cosine phi the phase plus v naught. OK. Hold up. Lake Jake, you're telling me that our average velocity depends only on the phase of our electric field and the initial velocity, the arbitrary initial velocity that our sodium ion has at time t equals 0. OK, so what does that mean? If this v naught is positive, our average velocity is going to be non-zero. So this phi works out. Uh, we could have that phi be 0, for instance. Uh, then we would get you know, a non-zero average velocity. That means that our sodium ion is drifting to one side. It goes in like little jumps, right? But it would basically look like you know, you have this sodium ion, and it's going to say it has an initial velocity of v naught. It's going to be moving, drifting in this direction, right? Then it's going to accelerate, because this electric field is building up in this direction. It's going to accelerate in this direction, and then, you know, you get back to the downwards of the sine curve. The AC current means that the electric field, this becomes the negative side, this becomes the positive side. Electric field switches direction. It feels an acceleration in this direction, going back towards the original place. If V0 was 0, this sodium ion would just move back and forth. And its net position would be constant. It wouldn't, make, it wouldn't have an average velocity. If it had average velocity, it would be 0. But it's not. That depends on the phase and the initial velocity. The initial velocity is in some direction, right? And that could mean that slowly over time, the sodium ion moves to one side of the gherkin. Bam! Hence, after some amount of time, we only see some glow on another side. Because all of the sodium ions have moved to that side of the capacitor, and they are bumping into each other. There's a higher concentration of them. So they're exciting off their electrons and then rebinding to their electrons and e emitting our photons that we see as that nice green sodium color. That's pretty cool. What Lecture Jake just said is reasonably correct, but there shouldn't be as much emphasis on initial velocity of the sodium ions as there should be on the initial phase of the current. That matters much more in determining the average velocity. Unfortunately, science Jake's mic cut out at the end of the video, so we're going to cut to a new Jake, iPad Jake, to explain what average velocity has to do with our problem. So we have a good idea of what our average velocity term might look like for the sodium ions in the gherkin. But 
what would it take for that average velocity term to be zero? This would mean that the sodium ions are drifting back and forth in a sinusoidal fashion, but they don't have a net drift in either direction. So over time, they do not collect on one end of the gherkin. So what would that take, what would our initial velocity need to be and our phase term for that to happen? So if we set this equal to zero, then we can, you know, subtract V naught from both sides, get V naught equals negative epsilon naught Q over M omega, I actually subtracted that, but it is the same thing. Then we're going to multiply by M omega, so we get M omega V naught over epsilon naught Q, don't forget the negative, equals cosine phi. Yep. So one thing we know about cosine, if it has no scaling term in the front, is that the maximum and minimum value of cosine are 1 and negative 1 respectively. So this would be 1 and this would be negative 1. That means that because this term is equal to cosine phi, it also must be have a max and min of 1 and negative 1. So we can just say that. We can say that negative m omega v naught over epsilon naught q is less than or equal to 1 and greater than or equal to negative 1. Now, what if we assume that our initial velocity is greater than 0? We can make that assumption and just look at the cases where that is true. Uh, if that's the case, then we would have that this term must be overall negative because of this negative sign in front and our initial velocity being positive, all these other terms are positive. So then we would have to say that negative one is less than or equal to negative m omega v naught over epsilon naught q. Uh, I'm, we're just gonna say As a reminder, uh, our m here is the mass of the sodium ion, omega is the angular frequency that it oscillates in the gherkin, v naught is our initial velocity at the time you start the current, epsilon naught is the magnitude of our electric field, and q is the charge of the sodium ion. And then we can decide, divide both sides by negative 1, and we get 1 is greater than or equal to, remember you need to flip the sign of that inequality, m omega v naught over epsilon naught q. Let's solve for our v naught, and we will get v naught is less than or equal to epsilon naught q over m omega. Okay, let's plug some numbers in. Let's see, well, what are these things equal to, and realistically, what would that mean that our v naught would need to be less than or equal to? Um, luckily, I've already written most of this out. Okay, as a reminder, our term for initial velocity we found to be less than or equal to epsilon naught q over m omega. That brings us to a, an initial velocity of less than or equal to 3.3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. That's a huge number. That's 100 times less than the speed of light. So what does this mean? Well, if we're confident that our sodium ions aren't going to tra be traveling from London to New York in less than two seconds, then we could always find a initial phase such that our average velocity could be zero. But then again, it's super unlikely for that to happen, right? If you're current is oscillating at 50 times a second, the chance that you're going to get exactly the phase that you need to have, such that the average velocity is zero, is pretty unlikely. But it also means that, you know, there's a reasonable chance that the sodium ions are going to drift to either direction. It means one more thing, though. This term we just found to be a very large number, 3.3 times 10 to the 6 meters per second. Our initial velocity of the sodium ions is very likely smaller than that. So we can approximate our average velocity by ignoring that smaller term and just saying that it's equal to epsilon naught q over m omega cosine phi. This gives us some more insight into our model. It says that the direction in which the sodium ions drift, or the average velocity, is dependent upon our phase and our initial velocity to a lesser extent. That means that our phase is very important in determining the direction in which the sodium ions drift. And it would be really interesting to see if you can control for that phase, you know, can you determine exactly which side will the glow of the pickle end up on? That's something for a later experiment, probably. I'll throw it back to Lake Jake, and he'll close out the video.
Thanks so much for sticking with us to the end. I hope you enjoyed it and got to learn something. Maybe leave a comment down below if you have an idea or an experiment that you think we could run to test if this model has any validity. Um, we loved getting to share our experiences and SOM2 has been a really great time working with one another. I think uh, it's just been a great experience to get to learn from one another and collaborate. I want to give a special thanks to Jan, our collaborator in Germany, and Liam behind the camera. It wouldn't have been possible without them. So. Uh, here's to SOM3, and I hope you have a great rest of the summer. Uh, I'm gonna head inside now because it's starting to rain, and uh, maybe we will see you again someday. Is that okay? That was wonderful. That was okay. Really All right. Good job.